Michael Rothberg is a literary scholar, a Holocaust historian, and a scholar in memory studies. Currently, he's professor of English and comparative literature and holds the 1939 Society Samuel Goetz Chair in Holocaust Studies at the University of California in Los Angeles. He has a most impressive academic career and publication list. And recently, he published another seminal monograph titled The Implicated Subject Beyond Victims and Perpetrators that reflects on and um, complicates the role of the so-called bystander. And he's about to complete a new book on German public memory in Germany's transformation to an immigration society together with Yasemin Gildis that we are waiting eagerly for. When we talk about the concept of multidirectional memory, we are dealing with academic, scholarly, thoroughly, methodically researched ideas, academic knowledge on how memory works and on its historical realities and present potentials an academic knowledge that suddenly here in Germany hits onto and becomes drawn into political conflicts about memory and consequently becomes part of the story itself, which is quite exciting, but also probably disturbing. And I'm ever more grateful to Michael for having agreed to give this talk in the middle of this turmoil. The event is part of Bard College Berlin's lect lecture series, Global Histories of Migration, it takes place within the framework of and is funded by the Mellon Cluster of Forced Migration, Displacement and Education. And we thank the Mellon Cluster for the support. After the talk, Michael will engage in a discussion with Frank Wolf, a historian with focus on migration history, Jewish history, transnationality and human rights, who's currently teaching at Bard College Berlin, lectures at University Osnabrück and works for the Institute for Migration and Intercultural Studies in Osnabrück. Michael and Frank will have a conversation about the book and its manifold implications for understanding German public memory and memory culture in the past and in the present. And after that, you are invited to join the discussion. And if you watch this on Facebook, you can write your questions and comments in the comment section, and I will then summarize and forward them to Frank as best as I can. And if you are here in the Zoom meeting, you can just raise your digital hand um, and now I hand over to Michael. Thank you again so much for being with us. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Marianne, for inviting me. I'm uh, really grateful for the opportunity to talk to everybody tonight. Um, I'm glad to be here. And uh, I'm also grateful to Frank uh, Wolf in, uh, in advance for, uh, for his questions and comments. And I look forward especially to the discussion. So thanks to everybody from Bard College Berlin for making this possible. And let me just mention also uh, and thank my, my German publisher, Metropole Verlag, and everybody who was involved in uh, making this translation possible. And we can talk more about that a little bit later. So as uh, Marianne already indicated, today I'm gonna talk about a book that was really not written for our present and was not written for a German audience specifically, um, but which I, which I hope um, can still speak to our present um, and can also speak to a German and international public as in fact it has in the original uh, English version already for, for some years. So today what I wanna do in my talk is um, first to lay out the context to which I was actually responding when I wrote the book, which I started almost, uh, no, more than 20 years ago in fact. Um, and uh, lay out that context and then uh, offer for you a kind of summary of the main arguments of the book and the trajectory of the examples that I discuss in the book, uh, assuming that some people will not know it. And then I wanna talk a little bit at the end, my last section, I'm gonna speak for about 30 minutes total, so I'll watch the clock as well, um, about what the book might mean in a German context and offer several different uh, possible angles of approach uh, for the German context. And, and as we go through, I'll, I'll make some comments along the way about some of the reception so far in Germany and some of the misunderstandings that I think uh, have, have emerged there. So the context to which I was responding in the US and to some extent internationally um, back in the early 2000s involved both public discourse and scholarly methodology. And it had to do both with 
the specificity of Holocaust memory, um, but also with questions more generally about memory um, at a moment when the field of memory studies was kind of emerging as a, as a self-conscious dis interdisciplinary field. Um, in terms of Holocaust memory, what I noticed, um, and again, I'm talking about it 20 years or so ago now, um, was a very consistent discourse that seemed to unite both scholars and people in the public about how memory worked and about how Holocaust memory in particular worked. And there was a kind of a shared understanding that memory took place in a sort of winner take all struggle among different group memories. Um, and this is something, there was a lot of talk at the time of what, what is still called a competition of victims. And we could talk more about that phrase later if you'd like. Um, and which I then called competitive memory. And my point there was that, um, not that there isn't competition, that there isn't conflict among memories, but what I saw as a shared understanding in which I ultimately thought was a mistaken understanding was the notion that when memories uh, bump up against each other, when they come into conflict, when they come into conversation in the public sphere, they follow the logic of what I call the zero sum game. It's a kind of logic of scarcity, uh, which stipulates that if we have one memory, therefore we can't have another one. In other words, the complaint was often that uh, too much memory of the Holocaust was preventing the articulation of other memories, in particular memories of colonialism or slavery in the United States from being articulated. And then on the other hand, those who were um, let's say proponents of uh, the, the, the uh, place of the Holocaust in the public sphere were worried that if these other histories started to be articulated, that the Holocaust would somehow lose out, right? That this was, this was the sort of zero sum logic that I observed, again, both among those who were proponents of Holocaust memory, putting this very simply, obviously, and those who were trying to articulate alternative uh, historical memories of, of trauma and violence and suffering. At the same time, um, and here's the sort of scholarly angle as well, um, I felt that there were certain kinds of assumptions within the field of memory studies and within the genealogy of literature on memory um, that shared some of these uh, limited assumptions about how memory worked. And so I'm thinking, first of all, back to the uh, what has been called by Astrid Earle, the first stage of memory studies, which is we could use Maurice Halbvox as an example there, who first conceptualized collective memory and the memory of groups, but there was a certain notion of a kind of homogenous uh, a group that came out of this first stage of, of, of thinking about memory in the early part of the 20th century. And then there was a second stage, which was quite influential when memory studies kind of came back as a field, starting in the 80s, with the work of Pierre Nora and Les Lieux de Mémoire, a big project uh, about the sites of memory, which then became uh, quite important internationally. And the limits of that second stage were a very closed sense of what the, of the nation as a container for memory. And so what I was trying to develop um, in my thinking about multi-directional memory was an alternative to this notion of the closed group that you get from the first stage of, of memory studies and of the nation as the ultimate frame and a certain homogenous notion of the nation cleansed, for example, of its colonial history, of the importance of migration um, that you find in the work of Nora and often gets repeated in other contexts, including the German one, when there was a German version of uh, Les Lieux de Memoir, Deutsche Erinnerungsorte, uh, I think. Um, also, migration right, plays a very small role there. So what I realized in retrospect that what I was doing was part of a new third stage of memory studies, along with people like Astrid Earle, who I mentioned, Anne Rigney, um, and many others who were starting to break open these kind of self taken for granted containers of the group or nation and starting to think more transnationally and more transculturally. So that is the moment of, and that's now well established in the field, but that was the moment at which I was writing when this was just starting to happen. So in responding to that public and scholarly context, I made three uh, primary arguments in multi-directional memory. So as opposed to this thinking of memory as obeying the logic of the zero sum game, um, I came to think of memory as productive, 
right, as a dialogue, as in, especially public memory, as emerging in a dialogical process in which there's borrowing and echoing and even appropriation um, where the materials of memory and the forms of memory are in some sense shared across what seem to be uh, fixed identity groups. So a multi-directional productive uh, logic instead of a zero sum logic based on scarcity. And that also led me to rethink the relationship of memory and identity. Try, again, trying to break out of these sort of containered, containerized notions of identity and to see memory not as an expression of a uh, pre-given fixed identity, but rather in a performative sense, right? As memories and identities coming into, uh, coming into being, becoming together, again, in a kind of dialogic process and one in which the boundaries of either memory or identity are not fixed, right? But are being performatively constituted in a kind of processual way. So I, I'm trying to complicate the relationship between memory and identity. And I don't, and just to, to, to make it clear, it's not that I don't realize that people um, are quite invested in their, in their group memories and their individual memories. But I think when you look from the outside, what you see is a lot more kind of sharing and um, a lot more openness in the relationship uh, and dynamism, I suppose, in the relationship between memory and identity than I think people often think about their own experiences and memories and also the way that scholars and even public figures were talking about it at the time. And the third argument I made following from those two is a kind of methodological one, which is that we need to rethink the way we write the history of memory. So I'm a memory scholar, but memory has a history. Um, and uh, and what, what, I, what I then tried, what I suggested and tried to then perform in the book was a kind of dialogic history of Holocaust memory. In other words, to be open to the way that it, uh, seemingly um, autonomous traditions of memory are um, influencing each other, drawing on each other, um, again, sometimes conflicting with each other, but transforming each other, um, that this is a more, uh, a, a new way, a different way of writing the history of memory that looks at memory dialogically. And the particular case I took, and again, it's not an arbitrary choice, um, but it can be done, I think, with other kinds of historical materials, was to consider Holocaust memory from the perspective of its interactions with um, memories of colonialism and slavery and also the ongoing process of decolonization. So one of the things I observed, and it's an obvious point in a way, but I don't think anyone had ever really thought it through before, was that the first 15 years after the war, a kind of formative period in which something like what we now recognize as Holocaust memory was starting to take shape was also kind of the high point of decolonization, right? Um, between the end of the Second World War and the early 1960s, uh, countries in Asia and Africa, many, many nations were becoming independent. There were wars of decolonization being fought. Um, nobody had ever asked, okay, do these things have anything to do with each other? And that's part of what I try to show um, in, my, uh, in the book. And I'll come back to some of those examples in a moment. I wanted to, before going on with, with to trace the trajectory of the book, I want to stop for a second with a sub point about what I see as one of the misunderstandings of the book so far in Germany. So my book is a challenge to what I would call the discourse on the Holocaust's uniqueness. It's not a challenge to the historical specificity of the Holocaust, right? I am not a historian of the Holocaust. I'm a scholar of Holocaust memory. And so what I'm looking at comparatively um, is, is the way that the Holocaust is remembered. And what I'm arguing is that that memory has always been in dialogue with these other memories and with histories like decolonization that may seem to have nothing to do with the Holocaust at all. Though I think even that is something we could interrogate, right? So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a critique of the way we think about memory. It's not a commentary on the his history of the Holocaust or the historical specificity of the Holocaust. I do believe that especially public memory, but I think some extent even our personal memories um, are again, always dialogical, right? So I don't know that a memory can, can ever be unique, especially a memory that's articulated publicly. And that's because what memory is, is always an articulation in the present 
of some particular past. So memory by definition is always bringing, bringing together two different moments in time and almost always two different places, right? Wh where you remember and what you're remembering are not taking place usually in the same place. And even if they are, that place has been transformed. So there's some sense, and this is part of my, ar my argument for, for memory scholars, that memory is structurally multi-directional. It's always linking up different moments in time and different places. And we need to think through the implications of that structural feature of memory. I do draw on Freud, though Freud is mostly thinking about individual memory. And I think he thinks he has taught us, he's taught me at least, to think about the complexity of memory at, at the psychic scale. So thinking about displacements and condensations and repressions and return of the repressed. All of this is not exactly the same as of course what happens socially or in public, but I think it can still be useful for um, conceiving of a kind of more dynamic uh, sense of how memory works. And I think when we do scale up to the group or to the society, that complexity that you find at the psychic level for someone like Freud becomes even greater, right? At the, so the social is certainly even a more uh, complex scale than the individual scale. So that's kind of a, uh, a methodological clarifying uh, bracket there for a moment. So I make those three arguments about uh, uh, the productive nature of memory, about the relationship between memory and identity, and about how we ought to rewrite the history of memory for particular events. But I don't just offer this argument abstractly. I introduce what I call a kind of archive or counter tradition of multi-directional memory. And, and frankly, this is a, another place where the German reception has just kind of ignored most of the book. They haven't actually engaged with uh, most of the examples that I bring to bear, empirical examples that I bring to bear um, in trying to, you know, to, to make the argument, uh, the theoretical argument about memory. So the, the, this kind of counter tradition that I offer is not meant to be exhaustive. It's not a strictly linear history. I'm not actually a historian. I'm, I am a literary scholar who works sometimes in a historical mode. It's more of a counter history, um, but it does uh, touch especially on a couple of two uh, specific moments that I think are important to understanding, especially the early history of Holocaust memory. Though the book as a whole covers examples that go from 1950 to 2005, and I actually think you could take it back further to 45 for sure, and I think you could certainly take it up to the present, but this is the, the focus of the book itself. The first period I look at is the early post-war period, and this is a moment when in English, at least, there wasn't even a word for these events. There was, we didn't use the word Holocaust until sometime in the 1960s. So there was no real sense at this moment of the specificity of the Holocaust. It was usually subsumed under a notion of Nazi atrocities or, so, or, or some other phrase like that. And that's largely true in other places as well, right? It's not, that's, that's I, I'm looking at it from the, from the sort of US perspective or the English language perspective, but I think you'd find similar things if you look at other uh, sites and other languages. And what I was interested to see though, was that despite the fact that there was no broad recognition of the uniqueness, as we would call it now, the specificity or singularity of the Holocaust, what you did see was a great deal of dialogue going on um, around the relationship between the Nazi genocide and colonial crimes and the history of slavery. And sometimes in those dialogues, even a kind of prescient sense of the Holocaust specificity that wasn't being grasped more broadly. And so the examples that I use in those for that early moment of, of uh, post-war Holocaust memory are sometimes well-known texts and some more obscure texts. The well-known texts are things like Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism or M.A. Césaire's Discourse on Colonialism. Though again, these were not necessarily texts that were being uh, thought of uh, as part of the history of Holocaust memory. So I was kind of reconfiguring them for my own purposes of thinking about them in a new way. And when you look at Arendt and Césaire, what I find for both of them is are moments of insight and moments of blindness, right? They're both struggling. What, what brings them together is that they're both, in fact, struggling to articulate the relationship between imperialism 
on the one hand and Nazi genocide and Nazi violence on the other hand. Um, and they're doing that in ways which it took scholars about 50 years to catch up to, um, but they're not doing it in perfect ways either. So there are problems in Arendt with how she thinks race and the kinds of un uh, critical uh, repetitions of colonial notions of race that you find in Origins of Totalitarianism, not something I actually wanted to find, but which I kind of inevitably saw was there. Or in Césaire, I think it's certainly true that he has a very powerful articulation of Nazi violence as a, a return shock, a shock en retour, a kind of boomerang effect of colonial violence. But he doesn't have in that discourse on colonialism a very strong sense of the specificity of the Holocaust. That's simply true. Where I did find, and in a, in a more obscure text, at least at the time, what I thought was a powerful articulation of a relational notion of, uh, of the Holocaust to other forms of racial violence was a short text by the great African-American thinker, W.E.B. Du Bois, in a piece that he wrote, um, published in 1952, called The Negro and the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, published in a Jewish communist magazine and describing a trip that Du Bois took to Warsaw in 1949, where he saw the, the rubble essentially of the city and particularly the rubble um, to which the Nazi established ghetto had been reduced, as well as Nathan Rappaport's uh, monument to the Warsaw ghetto uprising, which had been erected the year before he visited. So what he saw was this field of absolute destruction. And what Du Bois wrote a few years later was that this helped him to reconceptualize his own thinking about race and his own experience of racism. And what I found so powerful about his articulation, and again, in a moment when there was not so much sense of the specificity of the Holocaust, was precisely that he was able to see that what he perceived in Warsaw was not in any way the same as what he himself had experienced, though he himself had experienced a great deal of racialized violence. Um, but at the same time, he was able to try to think these different histories together in a, in a relational way. So he says that I realized that my own experience of racism, um, which I had long thought of as, as separate and unique, was in fact not separate and unique. It was not the same as this other history, but it had to be understood in a more global, a more globalized context. So for me, that was a kind of inspiring moment, um, even though when I first discovered it, I did not ha yet have the vocabulary of multidirectional memory. And you see articulations like that in the same period, also from the Jewish side, if you will. So I write about the Polish French Jewish author, Andrzej Schwartz Bart, who also thinks about his own experience as a Holocaust survivor and someone whose family was killed in the genocide um, through his encounters with, uh, with people from the Caribbean and through his understanding of what slavery meant for those people. And he finds a kind of commonality um, or potential commonality, in fact, I think a stronger commonality, equalization of different histories through the figure of slavery, which for him connects Jewish experience, also going back to the Exodus um, and up to the Holocaust with that of the Caribbean West Indians that he was meeting in France in the 1950s. So that was the early post-war moment. Again, a moment when you don't have a lot of sense of the Holocaust specificity, but there's a lot of interesting dialogue going across histories, going on across histories, and occasionally you're also getting some notion of specificity. The other moment that I really discovered during the course of writing was the moment of 1961, and particularly the, the era of the Algerian War of Independence as it played out, especially in France, um, for left-wing kind of anti-colonial or anti-war activists, but also I think more broadly. 1961 is a really important moment for thinking about Holocaust memory because it's the moment of the Eichmann trial. And most narratives of Holocaust memory take this as a pivot point at which Holocaust memory kind of goes global, starts to become transnationally, a transnational phenomena. And it comes specifically out of the way that the Eichmann trial was staged uh, by the Israeli state and the Israeli prosecutors. Um, in particular, the calling of 111 eyewitness uh, uh, survivors to testify in the trial, even though in fact, their testimony didn't have that much to do with convicting Eichmann. You could have all done that already based on uh, the other kinds of evidence they had, but they wanted to create 
a kind of new image of the Holocaust as a unique event. I mean, this was very explicitly articulated um, in the course of the trial and, and I think was ultimately very successful. So 1961 was this important moment already in thinking about Holocaust memory. But what I found as I started to dig into um, this moment of the Algerian war in France was that there were other things going on as well, right? So that it wasn't just the Eichmann trial that was driving um, an increased interest and increased visibility of the Holocaust, at least in France at that moment, it was also the Algerian war. And again, if you think about it, it's not as crazy perhaps as it sounds. And the idea here is not that what was happening in the Algerian war, and from my perspective, was in any way the same as what was happening in the Holocaust. That's not at all the point. Well, the point though, I think, is that this is only 15 years after the war. And a lot of the people in France who were involved in the struggle around Algeria, had themselves been involved in the resistance to the Nazi occupation. Many of them had been deported by the Nazis to camps. Some were Jewish, some were not Jewish. Um, and some actually had collaborated with the Nazis as well. So the, the memory of that past was very much present. And it was triggered, again, despite what we, what, what we might see as the very obvious historical differences between the two events, it was triggered by certain features of the French prosecution of the war, in particularly torture and the use of concentration camps, right? And so you have testimonies by people at this moment saying, the torture I underwent under the French police during the Algerian war reminded me of the torture that I went underwent uh, by the Gestapo during the Nazi occupation, right? And the fact that Algerians were being held in great numbers in camps brought up the memories of Nazi camps, inevitably in a certain sense, and people were making connections. And it was also in a moment when testimony uh, was very important because the French state was um, involved in very heavy censorship. It was almost impossible to speak publicly about what was actually going on. And so people developed all sorts of extra legal uh, samis dot, uh, means of, of testifying. And so the whole notion of testimony uh, became came very charged at that moment in, in the relationship to the Algerian war and started to echo into uh, uh, testimony to the Holocaust as well. I can give more example, more specific examples later, but I just wanna, so just to kind of illustrate um, the sort of archive that I'm drawing on and make the methodological point here. Again, what I was trying to do was to take this moment that we already knew was central to the emergence of Holocaust memory and rethink it from a different angle, look at it from a different perspective. And I think there's quite a lot of evidence to show that there was this dynamic relationship here between a war of decolonization, memories of decolonization, memories of colonialism and memories of, of the Nazi occupation and Holocaust, at least in France at that particular moment. So I wanna, I don't wanna talk for too much longer um, but I wanna shift here to at least say a few things about how I think this argument might play out uh, in productively, I hope, in Germany today. Um, obviously to, uh, to produce a translation of this sort takes years. And in fact, this project does go back many years. I was approached by uh, my colleague, Felix Axter from the Center for Antisemitism Research in, in Berlin, who uh, was interested in translating it. And so I worked with him and he and his other colleagues, including Jana Kunisch, really worked hard on this translation over many years. Max Henninger was the one who actually did the translation. Um, we wouldn't know that it would eventually appear in the middle of what has become, a, let's say, a lively debate um, about uh, the comparability of the Holocaust and about the specificity of anti-Semitism in Germany. And I think you could trace this back, certainly at least to last year and the controversy around Achille and Bembe. Um, I think the roots of that, of course, go back further too, but that, that I think has kind of transformed the discourse and provided the context in which my book, for better or worse, is now being received. And of course, I stepped into that debate as well. So perhaps I have only myself to blame for some of the responses. I don't regret that, that, that I think was an important debate and ongoing, and there are ongoing issues there that I think are really crucial. And again, we can talk more about that. But let me make like five or six quick points that maybe we can then elaborate on later about, um, about multidirectional memory in Germany. First, from a scholarly perspective, what I wanna say is, we don't even know what a multi-directional history 
of Holocaust memory in Germany would look like yet, because I don't think it's been attempted, right? or at least to my knowledge, it, it, it hasn't been attempted, and I don't know all of the German scholarship. So what I mean is, it would be interesting to go back and rethink um, you know, the trajectory, the emergence and trajectory of Holocaust memory in Germany by being open to its interactions with other histories with which it may have intersected. Um, in, histories of flight and migration, histories of the East-West division, um, you know, histories of the relationship between the German left and anti-colonial movements, right? There, there are lots of different ways that this might be done. I have no prescription for that. I'm just saying, I don't think we know yet what a more comparative history of Holocaust memory in Germany would look like. And it'd be interesting to explore that. In public discourse, um, I think what I'd wanna say is that, um, there's been a turn in the what I call the political valence of comparison and uniqueness um, sometime in the last you know in the last decades. And so, for example, right, a key moment was obviously the historical strike of the 1980s, a moment when Habermas very rightly asserted the specificity of the of the Holocaust against the relativizing moves of conservative historians like Ernst Nolte. And again, I think absolutely correctly. I think in the present context, the present public context, the meaning of uniqueness and the meaning of comparison has shifted. And I think it has to do with questions of uh, responsibility, really, ultimately. I think what was wrong uh, with the conservative position in the historic strike was not the simple fact of trying to compare the Holocaust to Stalinism, the gulags to Auschwitz, it was how and why the comparison was being made. And so what I'm trying, what I'm suggesting is we need to pay more attention to the how and the why than the simple fact of comparison, because I think there's an inevitability to comparison, even when we're asserting uniqueness that implies a kind of, there's an implicit comparison being made. And I think this connects to questions of activism that are going on right now in Germany around the memory of colonialism, especially, and around reparations for the Herero and Nama genocide in today's Namibia, then German Southwest Africa, right? That these are, that, that what people are asking for here is not a substitution of one historical memory or one form of responsibility for another, but really an, an addition, right? That we can think more, uh, we can think more richly about uh, German history and German responsibilities and German memory by bringing in uh, in these histories that have stayed more on the margins for, for whatever reasons. Um, I think a very fruitful angle for a multi-directional approach to Holocaust memory in Germany and it is through the question of migration. And this is just one of many possible ones and there are different ways of even bringing migration to bear here, obviously. Together with Yasemin and Yildiz, I've been pursuing a kind of long-term project, which isn't quite so close to completion as Marianne implied at the beginning, but hopefully eventually will be, um, thinking about the relationship between guest worker migration, specifically and especially Turkish Germans, um, and Holocaust memory. And um, I can happy to talk more about that project as well. I think there's interesting kind of, re again, the histories are in no way alike. I'm not, we're not making any claims like that. But I think that from the beginning, actually the guest worker migration was always entangled with the memory of the Holocaust. And I think that continues to play out today in the way that um, German society deals with questions of migration and, and racialized minorities. Um, Finally, I just want to throw this, put this on the table since it was in the, um, in the title of the talk. But again, it's something I think that we need to discuss more because I certainly don't have the answers is the question of post-colonial studies in Germany. Um, one of the odd uh, features of a lot of the recent debates for me at least coming from the outside is the way that post-colonial studies gets invoked. And it's really not clear to me what the referent is um, when post-colonial studies is being invoked in public. And maybe that's not so different from other national contexts as well. I think there's certainly something similar going on in France right now and we have our own issues in the US as well. Um, but what strikes me is that there is, on the one hand, a fairly long tradition, scholarly tradition, um, also connected to certain forms of activism of thinking about post-colonial studies in a German context. I just went back and looked up a couple of the texts that I know, something like um, Encarnacion Gutierrez Rodriguez 
and Hito Steirl's collection, uh, Sprich die Subalterne Deutsch, right? Does the subaltern speak Deutsch, which was a uh, German, which was an early, um, an early attempt to think about post-colonial studies in a German context, or the book by Nikita Dawan and Maria uh, Domar Castro Varela, kind of introduction to post-colonial studies that has gone through multiple, um, uh, multiple editions in German. So there are many people working in these areas, but that's not very much reflected in the public discussions. And I think that's interesting and important to signal. Um, and I hope that those people will, who I mentioned and others will, you know, will can be also more prominent in some of these debates need to be more prominent in some of these debates um, in terms of multi-directional memory um, beyond the historical link that i tried to make in my book between holocaust memory and the age of decolonization the theoretical point i, I would want to make coming out of post-colonial studies is this notion for example of tensions of empire that you get from frederick cooper and anna uh, and laura stoller um, which is about the ineluctable and power-laden relationality between the metropole and the colony, or more broadly in the post-colonial world, I believe, between the global north and the global south. Um, in other words, you know, we can't, in a post-colonial world, we can't think of Europe in isolation from non-European spaces. We can't think of the formerly colonizing world separate from the formerly colonized world. Uh, and because of the kinds of neo-colonial relations in which we are all uh, implicated, I guess, in my terms. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the Mbembe debate um, in terms of its content, but even more maybe in terms of its form, is that it shows us how entangled uh, cultural political debates have become today and debates about memory have become today. And so I'll just end with this last observation, which is that the historical strike in the 1980s was an entirely inner German debate. I mean, it had resonance throughout the world and certainly in the US, um, you know, we were reading about this and in retrospect, thinking about it quite a bit, but the debate itself was, really among German men, and it really was all men, as far as I've been able to say, of a particular generation, uh, people who were born uh, just before or during the Nazi period, if I'm not mistaken, so were children essentially during that period. Um, it was a very limited, in some way, in that sense, demographically, a very limited kind of uh, discussion. The debate, about, uh, the debate around Mbembe, on the other hand, is very different. It's more international, right, from the central figure himself to those of us like myself or various Israelis uh, who got involved in the discussion, both within Germany and internationally. And there certainly were more women, but had a, had a, had a different gender composition than the historic strike did. People like Elida Osman or Eva Illouz um, were prominent, Susan Nyman were prominent in the debate as well. So there's the, the very form of the debate as well as the content that's at stake, which is now not just about a kind of inner European history of comparison, but a more global uh, network of comparisons, including the colonial world. Things have shifted. And I guess I think we need new frameworks and new concepts for thinking through that shift and making sense of it. And I hope that the multi-directional framework can be one of those that can help elucidate what's happening. I don't claim it's the only one or that it doesn't need to be adjusted in various ways, um, but I hope it can make a contribution to these ongoing discussions. And I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Uh, Michael, for this, um, yeah, very insightful and very, very concise uh, description of the complexities that are in your book and in your uh, further work. And um, I'm incredibly excited uh, to have the opportunity to talk a bit about some aspects that we could think out of this book, essentially, and and, and also look back at it. Um, when you envisioned the German translation of uh, your book, you certainly hoped for a public vital response, but <laughs> it hit, I think, at uh, the moment when the core question of your book, uh, the relation between Holocaust memory and the colonial past has also reached German public. Interestingly, though, when we meet today on the occasion of this new German translation, this put me into a lot of trouble when I reread uh, the book, um, <laughs> Uh, the setting of our conversation at Bard College Berlin takes it back to the English-speaking realm and simultaneously puts it in a German setting. Mm. 
<laughs> um, so this this might put me in some form of a translation trouble uh, today. But then again, I thought of it as um, something that might perfectly mirror the complexities in your book, because in many ways you are talking about processes of translations. We could call them. Um, multidirectional memory explores its subject by looking at a wide range of sources from philosophy, literature, arts, cinema, and more. Some of these authors are Jewish, others are not. Yet what seems to unite them, or most of them, is that in some form or another they are public figures with an intellectual position or a drive uh, in that direction. Um, yet the concept of multidirectional memory seems to reach beyond that circle. So reading your book then constantly made me think my own work, which I want to talk about a bit, uh, on the formation of Yiddish memory, culture since the late 19th century, and particularly Bundist memory, especially the early attempts, and you hinted at the, uh, those, those troubles, um, the, especially the early attempts to put the experience of the Holocaust into words, which for the Bundes started around 1943 with the first memoirs that were carried over, uh, produced many texts which neither fit into the traditional forms of Bundes memory that had as developed, uh, particularly in interwar Poland, nor into the canon that evolved later on from the 1960s. So these first texts were written by formerly, mostly formerly inexperienced authors. Um, if you work in Yiddish archi archives like the Yevo, they, they are filled with sources written by such survivors, searching essentially for words over those years. Their vocabulary, in, particularly for the Bundes, is inspired not by experiences of other groups, but by the Jewish past. Um, the key term that I think you could find there is uh, the term chum, destruction. In, in this context, it directly relates, the Choben directly relates to the destruction of the Eastern European shtetl, both in World War I and through modernization, which most famously described um, the ethnographer Anski in his book, Choben uh, Galicia. Anski then, of course, the person that was very popular in the emergence of the Yevo and the Yiddish culture and also wrote the Bund's anthem. So there's sort of a circle here how these ideas circulated in the, in, in, the, in the circles. But among these Bundist survivors now, there's also another relational usage, which, which I found striking, which I'm still struggling with when I go through the material. Many of them used the term camp, speaking of Nazi and Soviet per persecution the same. Bundist texts often put the victims of Auschwitz, the fighters of Warsaw and Vilnius, together with the suicide of Shmuel Siegelboim in London 1943 in protest against the world's silence despite the Holocaust, with the murder of party leaders Ehrlich and Alters and Alter and others in uh, Stalinist cells. So I think we somehow have to think of this through the victim's uh, perspective here that these early uh, writers are struggling with the specific Nazi violence, which you want to describe, but also the feeling that there's one big home um, that they are going through, the one destruction of the Bundist family that they grew up in. Um, so the specific victim position probably lets, led them to the emergence, uh, to um, driving the emergence of what we could think as a commemorative group diversity within Jewish memory, which often seems to be treated as one block. And uh, so what I would like to ask you in this context is, um, in your book, repeat, you repeatedly refer to Yiddish sources as well uh, on texts. Um, well, you do, <laughs> at least. <laughs> Or at least they're, maybe they're translations, um, um, but the, the sources behind them are also Yiddish. So um, the, 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 the focus, uh, you, you mainly focus on sources from other languages. Um, and against that background, I wonder if you could speak a little about your choice of sources and what the choice of language and also the position of class for these speakers means for their formation of uh, multidirectional memory. Thank you. Um, that was really fascinating, actually. And I have to admit, I do not speak or read Yiddish. And uh, I wasn't aware that I was referring to Yiddish sources in my book. I'd like to hear more about that. But, but one of the things that your comment makes me realize, and I think this is really, really important, is that um, the very, and it, it reminds me of uh, James Young's really important first book, Writing and Rewriting the Holocaust, is that 
the victims themselves in the middle of the events were had to understand what was happening and um they were uh employing as i think you're 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 saying or implying um forms of comparison themselves right that they were so how do you understand your own experience how do you understand something that's happening to you that is unprecedented indeed that you don't yet have words for you refer back to the tradition right this is one of the points i think you were making you refer back to the khurban right which also goes back to the destruction of the temple and um, and young in that book, uh, you know, makes the point that these this, the language that we use, the metaphors that we use, the comparisons that we use, are in fact matters of life and death. Right? Do you perceive what's happening to you as part of this long tradition or as something specific and new? And it and how you respond to the events will then depend on the kind of conceptual framework in which you put it. So I think that's really fascinating, that on the one hand. And I think that the point about, uh, about Stalin and the Stalinist Soviet uh, uh, persecution and camps is, is an interesting one and a slightly different one, though also related is, you know, we're talking about people whose own experiences are not necessarily singular, right? That they're already comparative, that they're experiencing different forms of, of violence or have experienced different forms of violence or are aware that their communities are experiencing different forms of violence. So they're also thinking comparatively, I suppose. And that's neither good nor bad. My point is just that's the way we think, right? And that's that's one of the things I say about comparison is that it's, it's simply a, a fundamental feature of human cognition. The way we make sense of the world as, way with, as well as the way that we remember things is always gonna be comparative. We're always looking for um, patterns. We're always looking for resemblances as well as differences. And again, it's neither good nor bad. It's simply how we, how we as humans, I think, function in the world and function historically. Um, so I think I take those points as really, really interesting and important. I'm also fascinated um, by your point about translation. Um, and because I have been, I don't have anything profound to say about it, but I have been thinking a lot about it, what it means, you know, for my book to be translated which isn't just a matter of language. Of course, most people in Germany could read my book in the original. So for a long time, I didn't even think there would, we needed a German translation. I thought, well, anybody in Germany who's interested would read it already, but something happens when it's translated. Perhaps it gets a slightly different audience, but it's also translated across context, obviously. And that's what's especially interesting in terms of what's happening right now. So again, I think this is a really interesting test case for thinking about translation both linguistic and cultural and, and kind of historical. What happens when you take a text from one moment and one context and, 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 and reintroduce it in another moment in a different, in another context. So I think that's, I'd love to talk more about that. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by it. Um, in terms of my own approach to, um, to my sources, I have to admit it's not highly systematic. Um, and here's where I think disciplinary questions probably come, you know, play a play a big role. And I'm really not a, trained as a historian at all. Um, I appreciate history and 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 maybe dabble in it a little bit, and certainly don't think we can talk about something like the Holocaust or, for that matter, colonialism without a grasp of the history. But I'm not actually disciplinarily a historian. So what that means as as a literary critic instead is that I think we're used to starting from particularities, right? We taught, we start in fact from singular texts and we work out from there. And so, you know, I was trained in what we call close reading and I still value it greatly. And I think it's one of the specificities of the approach of literary critics. And so I take a short text like Du Bois's The Negro in the Warsaw Ghetto and I, you know, and I, and I look at it closely and I, and I try to work out from it. And I also try to put it in its historical context. And that was a really important part of the reading for me. When I first, I had first found it in an anthology, when I actually found the journal in which it had been published and realized it was a communist journal, everything changed. I had to rethink the way I'd approach the text. So context obviously works, but for me, I tend to start from the singular text and work out from there and look for the kind of network of associations that you construct, that you can construct through it and need to construct in order to make sense of it. So the Du Bois was one version of that where I, you know, I found this text. And then once I realized its context, it led me into this whole question of kind of Cold War memory, 
right? And, and what he was doing that sort of fit into the dominant Cold War memory of the time from the left and the ways that he might've been breaking from that at the same time. The other moment, it's the moment I mentioned a little bit in my, in my talk as well, this 1961 moment, again, was a kind of accidental discovery. I'd written the Du Bois piece. I, I, I've been thinking about some of these questions for some years. I, I had kind of been envisioning the project initially as a, as a project about blacks and Jews and kind of rethinking the black Jewish question as it was called in the US, especially at that time from a more international transnational perspective. Um, and I was attending a lecture by the um, African film scholar, Machia Diawara, where he was uh, talking about and showing his film, uh, Rouge in Reverse, which is a documentary he made about the French ethnographic filmmaker, Jean Rouge. And he mentioned this film by Rouge uh, called Chronicle of a Summer, Chronique d'un été, French film that appeared in 1961. You'll start to see why I'm interested, in which at the center of this film, which called itself Cinema Verité, it was the first film that called itself Cinema Verité. So a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, direct uh, cinema, direct documentary form, um, that Rouge had staged a conversation between a Jewish survivor of Auschwitz and uh, a set of African students that he knew, in which they bring together uh, uh, questions of colonialism and decolonization, and then the experience of this woman, Marceline Loridan, as she was known then, um, of being deported to, to Auschwitz and then returning, deported with her father, returning alone. And there's a test testimony at the center of the film, which is completely unexpected. It's a film about everyday life in Paris. All of a sudden you get this story of Marceline Loredan about her deportation to Auschwitz. And I, so I was, when I, when I heard uh, Mancha Diawara describe that, I said, oh my God, I have to see this film. And I immediately went out and got a video copy. That's how long ago this was and watched it. And, um, and then again, I had to make sense of it. What was going on here? Why were these different histories being brought together? And the more research I did, the more I discovered this context of the Algerian War of Independence that I described earlier, and came to see that you had to see her testimony in relationship to this very um, active uh, context of uh, debate about torture and camps, and also this rhetoric of testimony testimony and truth, which was very important to the anti-colonial movement at the time, again, revealing French crimes, trying to evade censorship. And Chronicle of a Summer was the only French film released during the Algerian war that actually mentions the war, the only one. And it does it in a very indirect and not particularly profound way. But what I came to see, or the way I came to read it was that Marceline's testimony was serving as a kind of allegory for these other testimonies to colonial violence, which you could not articulate in the public sphere. You would have been shut down immediately by the French state. And so there was a kind of interesting comparative allegorical relationship between Holocaust testimony and testimony to colonial violence. So I kind of dug into this context and that led me to more things and it, it led me to finally understand why Charlotte Del Beau, whose writings on Auschwitz were so important to me for many years and who I wrote about in my first book, Traumatic Realism, why in fact the first book she published in 1961 again was about the Algerian war. It wasn't her memoirs, Auschwitz and After. Those were only published later, even though she'd written them before. And so I asked myself, why is it that Del Beau published this book about Algeria before she published about Auschwitz. What's the connection there? And I started to trace a kind of set of connections between her writings about the camps, the Nazi camps, and her response to the Algerian war. Um, so I guess that these are just illustrations of the way I work with sources, which is, again, sometimes a little bit accidental, but, um, but also trying to work through the singularity of a text out into the broader social and political context. And I guess what I'm trying to do in this, again, it's not, an, it's not meant to be an exhaustive history, but rather to try to, to try to find exemplary moments where we see this transfer and dialogue between histories that we have been, ex that we've expected and been trained to see as separate from each other, but which I actually see, you know, again, the memories of them at least are intertwined and entangled. Yeah, thank you. You, you mentioned 19, 1961 as mm. this turning point year that you talk about a lot in your book and which I found striking um, uh, in so many ways because for me it was a very unusual 
way of looking at 1961, particularly as someone living in Berlin and, and working on the Cold War. Um, you think about, you don't, of course, okay, the Eichmann trial is something that you have in mind, but many other things isn't just, it just isn't there. Um, 1961 is pretty much coded here through the construction of the Berlin Wall. And from that angle, you could say that the two things in 1961 aren't really related. They, they may not have a lot uh, to do, but when I reread your book now, I make me think that maybe, maybe they have uh, to do a, a lot with each other. Um, and this speaks to what you just mentioned about the, the Cold War context of memory, which is constantly driven about, of compar about com through comparisons. And uh, this question of that you constantly think comparatively also, um, and the question now is not whether it's good or bad. But maybe there is a question of, 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 of that goes deeper um, to it. Um, because when you look at uh, the years before the construction of the Berlin Wall, West German audiences uh, looked at or public also, I looked at um, uh, the Berlin Wall very much, or described the Berlin Wall, uh, sorry, not the Berlin Wall, the, the division, German division, um, uh, through the terminologies and the emergence of the Eastern Bloc through the terminologies of colonialism. So one way was the Americans, uh, the American government invented the, the Captive Nations Week, which talks about the Soviet enslavement of captive nations and the Western government, Western German gov government often referred to GDR in very abstract terms, um, as a territory under Soviet rule. And they did this just a few days before the wall was built in their official bulletins. Um, this changed completely the night the wall was built. Uh, the night after um, Willy Brandt uh, steps forward and he looks at the barriers and says, these are the barriers of a concentration camp. And this image was echoed in the press up to Chancellor Adenauer's TV address in two days, I think, uh, later um, in the evening. People in West Berlin carried banners against the Ulbricht KZ. And after a while, the, the term KZ-Stadt was coined. And so we could see this only as a Cold War maneuver between delegitimization and distraction and the use of language to distance, distance the West from both the communist state and the common German past. But if you look at literature, there, there might be something that, that goes deeper. And I want to go into one example here, which is, I think, the first book um, that literally deals with the construction of the Berlin Wall, written by Wolfgang Paul. And it was still published in 1961 called Die Mauer der Schande, The Wall of Shame, um, which then, when um, Willy Brandt drops the concentration camp metaphors, becomes his main metaphor to uh, talk about uh, the wall. The, the, the wall of shame. Um, very much like what you described for France, Paul employs a new style of literature between somewhere art and documentary writing. And his imagery also relies on a borrowed register. Um, the West Berliners, he says, were condemned to observe the, the power, the, 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 this, the division in utter powerlessness and silence on that night the wall was built. And then he reflects the following, and I quote, the Jews had their wailing wall in Jerusalem, he described. After the city was divided, the wailing wall fell to Jordan, but the Israelis had a free state. They did not need the wailing wall anymore. We can still visit our wailing wall, he writes. And then he continues, let us look into the faces of the Germans standing a hundred miles from that wall in the West, terrified, helpless, yes, innocent faces on our side, determined faces, on the other, then he describes an old woman who jumped from the third floor of the house, still marked by the war. So still, again, there's his reference. She, she jumped, they say, towards freedom. But when she reached freedom, she was dead. So I wonder in how far such Holocaust references to the ghettos, so the vanity of escape, the trauma of homelessness are somehow multidirectional or just borrowed registers. Um, and he gets very explicit when he concludes um, that with the construction of the Berlin Wall, uh, the forces under Ulbricht now had control, uh, now are uh, catching up with the final thing which the Nazis were still ahead of them. Quote. We could ask again, what does he mean by the final thing? If you want to do this close reading, yeah? He, a bit later, um, he, 
He writes about this in his book. Uh, in 1961, remember, the Eichmann trial shook the world and most Germans retreated to the posture of not knowing anything. Um, not so Paul. Paul. He, he, he opens uh, this, his chapter on the immured with a quote. It goes, on 31st October 1940, the ghetto was finally defined and the gates were closed. Under the penalty of three months up to one year of prison, it was forbidden for Jews to leave the ghetto without special permission. And he continues in his own words right directly after this. Overnight, the wall continued to grow. It has lost its improvised character. The military border is turning into a ghetto wall reaching all through the city. This initial quote, however, is taken from a memoir written by the Bundes Bernhard Goldstein, the star's bear witness, which appeared in German in 1950. So when Paul later on writes, quote, the asso these associations are overwhelming to us, but they do not overdramatize the historical moment. We are standing in front of a ghetto for Germans built by Germans. He knows what he is actually talking about. So he's not really struggling for words, I think. Well, this was an exciting discovery for me when I, when I looked at this um, because it unexpectedly connected my two books. I also wonder in how far this helps to further complicate the dynamics within or of that multi-directional memory. In my eyes, this adds the question of legitimacy to it. Uh, there, there is clearly a difference between the blunt labeling of the Kassettstadt on the political side and Powell's attempts to describe what he, in yet another obvious reference, calls the unimaginable of the Berlin Wall. In doing so, he not only relates the Berlin Wall to the Holocaust, he also interprets uh, the Holocaust through his present experiences. Then again, this comes with duties and uh, with, with, with the call for action which also Willy Brandt then himself, a survivor of Nazi persecution, refashioned in a similar notion when he said, quote, after 1933, we let a small minority be deported into the camps and we would again be complicit in a crime if we accepted the injustice done to the smaller part of our people today, that means. So there are many more examples along that line. Looking at question 1961, I therefore wonder, uh, sorry, at Germany in 1961, I therefore wonder, when, when here are we looking at multi-directional memory and when are we looking at distractions from that memory? Um, can we draw a line between multi-directional memory and appropriations, maybe in relation to the different implications of this speaking position? Thank you. This is also really fascinating. And this is a history that I really, I'll admit, I don't know a lot about. So it's, I'm learning something here, which to me is very, is indeed very relevant. Um, before I sort of try to answer the question itself, I also want to say that for me, 1961 and the wall in the German context is also, to refer to my other project, very closely linked to the question of Turkish migration to Germany, because it was in 1961 and directly after the wall and in part because of the wall that Germany and Turkey signed the agreement uh, to, uh, to start sending Turkish workers to Germany. And it's actually quite interesting. I haven't done a lot of research on this, but I've been struck by it. This is part of what I call resonances of the past in relationship between um, uh, migration and Holocaust memory. There are some statements by, uh, you know, that are that are a little bit related to this, um, where um, the um, the director of I think a Fauve factory in Wolfsburg or something like this is talking about the fact that we shouldn't call the places where these migrants migrant workers are living um, barracks or camps because these will bring bad associations we should still we should instead call them you know unterkunft or something like that some more neutral uh, uh, term so my sense is that there was also a kind of perception that uh, this is i mean this is why i think there are multi-directional links here there was a kind of perception that the guest worker migration um, you know, had certain kinds of complicated relationships to the Nazi history as well and to the Holocaust as well. And that's something we explore more in our project. And in fact, a lot of, I think, Turkish German writers and others have, have been exploring some of these kinds of questions as well. The complexity of the wall, I guess, for in relationship to migration. I think of, for example, a playwright, Hakan Savash Mijan, who's worked at the 
Waldhaus Nauninstraße and the Gorky Theater had a play, um, Die Schwene vom Schlachthof, um, which was precisely about different Turkish-German relationships to the wall and the division of East, in East and West. So I think there's a whole nother multi-directional set of links that one could add there in the German context, which I think are quite fascinating. In terms of the question of appropriation, I mean, I, I understand entirely and agree with you entirely about the problematic nature of some of these kinds of connections. I guess what I would say for as a starting point, again, as I said earlier, that I think comparison is an inevitability. I think appropriation is also a kind of inevitability um, when we think about memory also. And so the, the example I always give to my students when I'm trying to teach them about the social nature of memory, I say, um, you know, think of your earliest memory. Um, are you sure that you actually remember that or that in fact you might not have heard about this from your parents and you've heard the story so many times that now it seems as if it's your authentic personal memory. So I really feel like our even our most intimate, some of our most intimate memories are often influenced by the social context in which we remember, right? And so are already appropriations of other stories. Uh, the Jewish study scholar Jeffrey Chandler wrote a you know fascinating study of Holocaust survivor testimony in the in the uh, USC Shoah archive, where he showed that at a certain moment, you started to see the influence of Schindler's List in testimonies by survivors. So this is not, there's nothing, you know, this is expected in a certain way. Our memories are always incorporating others' memories, memories from outside. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't make them false, but it shows how our memories are, are colored um, by the context in which we are remembering. To go back to my earlier point, that said, um, I agree entirely that it's really important here to make distinctions. And I don't think this is one of the things that I think is in the book, multidirectional memory, but was not adequately developed. And the first essay that I wrote after finishing the book was an attempt in some ways to respond to the kind of question that you are posing, uh, Frank, which is how do we distinguish between different kinds of multidirectional memories? And I took on what I thought, for, what for me was, and I think still remains, one of the very most difficult cases of comparative memory, and that's invocations of the Holocaust in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian question, right? Incredibly charged and incredibly diff difficult terrain for me and really for just about everyone. And it goes without saying that these, these re Holocaust references appear everywhere and on all sides, right? Israelis, Palestinians, outsiders, insiders, everything, they're there. So how do we make sense of them? And often we, we wish maybe they weren't there, but they are there, and I don't think they're gonna go away because the histories are again entangled themselves. So what I tried to develop in writing about that in an essay called From Gaza to Warsaw, um, also included in my book, The Implicated Subject, was a kind of grid for making distinctions between different kinds of articulations of comparative or multi-directional memory. In the book itself, I think the main distinction I make is between those forms of multidirectional memory that um, uh, equate different histories and those that offer a more differentiated account of the relationship between different histories. And again, this is partly just an analytical tool. Let's see what we have and try to map that out. Personally, I am much more comfortable with differentiated approaches to these sorts of things. Um, but again, partly it's an analytical point. We can map them between a kind of equation and differentiation. But I realized that that was inadequate. So in the Gaza Warsaw piece, I intersect that axis, which I call the axis of comparison with what I call the axis of political affect. And that's an axis that runs from com competition to solidarity. And so you've got two axes, one equation to differentiation, one competition to solidarity. And it's you know, obviously a somewhat simplified tool, but I found it useful for making at least certain kinds of distinctions. So you ask yourself, how are these histories being brought together under the sign of equation and similarity or some sort of more resemblance and difference on the one hand, and then why are they being brought together? Are they being brought together to pit different victim groups against each other? or to create kind of solidarity uh, between different victim groups. And that's the way I kind of mapped it in my Gaza Warsaw essay. I was thinking though, in um, taking it to the German context, we might also wanna think differently about that axis of political affect, because I think maybe different things are at stake in the German context, not just competition, 
or solidarity, though I think in your 61 examples, that might actually work pretty well for some of those things, perhaps. But I was thinking more again in terms of the historical stride and then some of the debates today, that maybe we want a, an axis that runs from something like exoneration on one end to claims of responsibility on the other hand, on the other end, right? So again, the problem with Nolta was not just that he was equating apparently, you know, the Gulag and Auschwitz, but why he was doing it. He was doing it in the interest of exoneration, not in the interest of claiming, uh, you know, of, of, of claiming a new responsibility or holding on to a German responsibility for the Holocaust. And to me, that's a really, that's an essential distinction in a lot of these German debates. Um, you know, maybe all of these things can be mapped together. I'm not entirely sure, um, but that's sort of the way I would approach it. Um, you know, again, how are these things being compared under the sign of the same or under the sign of difference? And then why are they being compared? Competition or at last, right? Exoneration, solidarity, or um, uh, commitment to a certain kind of responsibility. And I think that doesn't answer all the questions, but it helps us to kind of distinguish and map out some of the different kinds of articulations that you find. And again, what I think is an inevitably comparative field of public memory. Thanks. Um, this, this, would, this is maybe also would call for interdisciplinary work here because um, the question of intentions um, always are very problematic to to historians at least because um we tr really need to find the smoking gun Problem, <laughs> and, yeah. Pro yeah problematic to us problematic to us too so i think that's interesting i mean we we have the what we call the intentional fallacy so i think you're right it's <laughs> okay it's okay. it's tricky to that might be tricky to um to uh unpack. I don't think it necessarily relies on intention. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you can totally evade it either. It's an inter that's a really interesting question. Hmm. Yeah. And this also, I think, takes us to a point that is the mirror image of your book. Um, and I, I want to go back to what you introduced as uh, the logics of scarcity. And the idea that um, the, ma many of these problems only occur because you have these idea that there's a zero sum game, um, that there is this division um, between this is memory that is appropriate here and this is not appropriate memory here. And because it overshadows the real important memory. Um, so if you arrived at, the, when you arrived at this point, looking at uh, the this memory not as zero sum game, but as a practice that can only live and survive when it's being practiced, performed, when it's echoing, when it's creating resonances, and they might be resonances from somewhere else. Um, the question is then why and how did we stick with this idea of a zero sum game in the first place? Um, where is it actually coming from? Or do you have an, an, an idea? Um, that the premise of your book, that what you want to differentiate yourself against or move away from, uh, is a detection of something that I wonder where, where is it coming from? That there is this perception of a zero sum game of memory, when in fact we have these practices of the 1940s, 50s, 60s that are so much drawing from each other in all kinds of reservoirs. Um, what has happened on, on, on the way? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, and it's, I find it to be a difficult question actually. And I don't know that I have a a, a really great answer for it, though I probably should by now. Um, I was thinking as I've been thinking about it, though. I mean, it is something that I think about a lot. I guess in some ways, what I would say is that the this uh, the notion of memory as obeying the logic of scarcity or of the zero sum game is probably by necessity a post uniqueness discourse, right? Until you have a notion of a particular history or memory's uniqueness, I don't think you get the discourse around, um, around scarcity and uh, around, uh, around the zero sum game. So again, the, the, the discourse of uniqueness is a real discourse and it has real effects in the world. And one of them, 
is perhaps, and again, I'm not just talking, I mean, I am talking about the Holocaust, but I don't think it's unique to the Holocaust. I think this could also happen in other contexts as well. I think once you get a discourse that, that uh, functions according to the logic of uniqueness, it follows therefore that you, you start to get the sense of the zero sum game that those who are defending the uniqueness feel they have to defend it against everything else, right? And those who feel they're outside that discourse feel they need to uh, disrupt and displace it. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, I do think that has a lot to do with it. I think, how did it come about? You know, these things are complicated, I suppose. And I don't, I don't have, I don't think, know that there's a singular answer. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, there was very explicitly, Ben Gurion says this explicitly around the time of the Eichmann trial, that the goal of the Israeli state in holding the Eichmann trial was to create an image of the Holocaust as a unique and unparalleled crime in history. I say that neutrally, I mean, that's just literally what he says. And so it does seem to me that there's a certain state produced uniqueness that you see there in Israel. And I think probably something similar happens in post-unification Germany, perhaps, right? That the uniqueness of the Holocaust becomes a kind of foundational element of a public official national identity. Um, and that that, you know, gives it a certain kind of, you know, a particular kind of, of prominence, obviously. Um, I think that, you know, and, and so I think that, um, how to say this exactly? I mean, I think it does have to do with questions of power then, right? Who, who is, you know, who has the kinds of definitional power to establish the centrality of certain kinds of historical memories who feels and who in fact doesn't have the kind of discursive power or capital um, to, to make their own interventions into that space. So I think both, that's why I think you get this logic sort of from both sides as I tried to describe it. And as I describe it in my book, again, both from those who are trying to hold on to this notion of the Holocaust as unique and from those who are trying to challenge it from these other minoritarian positions. For both, it looks like a zero sum game. I guess what I see as my role as a scholar in looking at that is to look at it from the outside and to see that, but that's not actually what happens, right? It actually isn't a zero sum game. And I think that's true in, in Germany as I think it was true in the US. I think that the centering of the Holocaust in the US actually led to more discussions about other histories, right? I think we talk more about slavery as we should, and to some extent more about genocide of indigenous peoples because the Holocaust has come to occupy such a prominent place. And it seems to me true also that in Germany, a lot of the really important discussions that are happening now about German colonialism are in fact uh, an effect of the centering of the Holocaust in the post-unification phase in the German national space. Um, you know, because it's not as if before the Holocaust, you know, the Holocaust belatedly came to occupy that important position in Germany, as everyone, I think, will agree, right? And it really, I mean, there's different ways of tracing that history. The 80s is certainly a very important moment when you've got all of these grassroots projects that are starting to build and starting to create local memories of the Holocaust. And it's really only, um, as I understand it, in the post-unification phase, when it really becomes nationalized and to a certain extent monumentalized. And you see that, you know, the emblem of that is of course the, the Mon Mal in, in, uh, in, in, in the center of Berlin. Um, so in all of those years, in all of those decades before the Holocaust became so central to German con public consciousness, right? It's not as if lots of discussion or debates about colonialism were going on then, as far as I know, and if I'm wrong, I'm, I, I'm ready to be stand corrected. It seems to me that they emerge partly in response to, in dialogue with the way that the Holocaust has come to be remembered. So I guess I, I, I still think it's important to make this distinction between how people think of them, how people think of memory and how they experience it on the one hand and how when we step back from it and look at the larger dynamics, things seem to unfold. That's sort of what I have for you at the moment in, in terms of that question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's, that's really and I'd be interesting. And I'd, be, I'd be curious what you think about, I mean, because this is sort of something I've been thinking about, this sort of, again, the relationship between Holocaust memory in Germany and the way it becomes kind of nationalized. And to me, at least, the way that seems to trigger this other kind of engagement with other German histories that, that was, you know, that has become in fact more prominent in the, in recent years, not prominent enough by any means, but more prominent. 
Yeah, I would. I think I would largely agree with you. Uh, but probably, as you as you were speaking, I was thinking about in how far um, the Cold War maybe uh, also plays a role in this sense that the binary logic of the Cold War that is always uh, inclusion or exclusion, it's uh, winning or destruction, and um, that 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 yeah. That idea, that ideology that's underlying so many decisions, uh, grounding so many decisions in Cold War also mm -hmm. plays a role here. And, and we are now in a multipolar uh, mm -hmm. setting that maybe opens up uh, some of these possibilities and also anxieties connected uh, to it. Really, I think that's really interesting, actually. And I think you're right that there's, I mean, part of what happens, you know, with the fall of the wall, with the decline, you know, end of the Soviet bloc, um, you get this, you know, new phase of globalization, and it indeed a kind of breaking out of that binary logic of the Cold War, and a kind of more multipolar, multi-directional, if you will, uh, flows that start to happen at that moment. So yeah, there's a lot going on at the same time. I think that's a great point. Oh, th thank you. Um, we could, I think, uh, continue. We should continue this, uh, but we'll have to do this in another form. We still want to use a few minutes, if you allow, um, for a couple of questions um, from the audience. And absolutely. If uh, thank you. And if I look at the chat, um, first of all, um, I'm asked to say that uh, people on Facebook can also uh, write their comments in the comments section on Facebook or the questions in the Facebook section and we'll read them out here if we find the time. Um, and Marion, you have a question already that you would like to ask. Yeah, everybody one. else, if you, sorry, Marion, sorry. Everybody else on Zoom, if you wanna ask a question, please just raise your hand and um, I'll call your name, please. Yeah, I'd like to forward a question that came up on the uh, Facebook um, page um, on, um, whether you could comment on comparing two specific historical moments in the emergence of memory in, in Germany, like two generations actually. One, the activists of the late 1970s and early 1980s, who were mostly citizen historians and were invested in digging up the local national socialist past and creating mm. adequate forms of memorials and memory across West Germany. Um, and the, the other one, the de decolonial activists now, who um, do have the support of scholars, interestingly, but are up against the bureaucracy and politics of memory in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I mean, again, I'm not an expert on all matters of German memory, and 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 even though I'm passionately interested in what's going on right now in Germany, um, it's also been a few years since I've been there, and I don't feel entirely in touch. But yeah, I think that there's, I think that's an interesting connection. It's one that I've been thinking about too. Um, I guess, you know, for me, the, I, I really like very much um, this book by Jenny Wustenberg on civil society and memory in post-war Germany, uh, which I've learned a lot from precisely about that late 70s, 80s moment of grassroots memory activism. And this is memory activism has become a huge topic in the field of memory studies today in all different contexts, uh, including the ones that we're discussing today. And um, Jenny Wustenberg's uh, book is precisely about that, that 70s, 80s generation. And so I guess what I see happening is, right, I, I think that to me then a major change, and it's one of the differences then between that historical straight moment of the 80s and the debates that are going on today is that that was a moment of a kind of insurgent um, grassroots memory, a memory from below, right? That again, in the post-unification moment becomes monumentalized and nationalized, right? And I think that you lose some of the uh, really exciting, progressive, um, you know, grassroots elements of that memory culture when it becomes monumentalized and nationalized and claimed as part of national identity. I think that the, you know, the, the kind of decolonial activism of today, the street renaming projects, et cetera, et cetera, which I know a little bit about, are, seem to me, at least in a formal sense, um, as if they may partly be inspired by that earlier grassroots moment themselves, right? So this is another 
you know, at the, not in terms of content, but in terms of form and strategy, it seems like this is potentially, and if I'm wrong, again, this is my kind of, you know, uh, speculation, um, there seems to be a kind of inspiration taken from this history of engagement with national socialism, which is now being used to engage with the history of, of, of German colonialism. And that seems to me, again, kind of fully within the logic of the argument I'm trying to make about, um, you know, about the way that memories emerge dialogically. And I think that what's then, but what's happened, of course, is with this monumentalization of Holocaust memory, you start to have a very, uh, you know, you have a very hierarchical, indeed, a power-laden relationship between that official Holocaust memory now, no longer the grassroots memory of the 80s, now an official state-sponsored memory, in a sense, and this memory which is struggling to make itself felt, uh, to make itself seen, um, to transform the memory landscape of German cities and of German uh, self-conceptions more broadly. Um, so I think there are both, you know, there are both then echoes of that earlier moment in today's activism, but of course the today's activists find themselves in a very, very different context and struggling with different kinds of forces and, and power relations, I suppose. I hope that provides some sort of uh, some sort of answer to the question. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, wonderful question that was also on my list. So I'm very happy <laughs> that, that it's asked because I really think this is striking um, what you're telling, um, particularly in this moment when you look at the reception of the book as well. Um, uh, uh, but as next person, I would like to call a student of mine. I'm very happy um, you raised your hand. Uh, Miksha Gaspa has a question. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting and a, and a great, great, great discussion. Uh, my question is a little bit more general and it, it concerns the way how you were also talking about the Holocaust and the, and the memorial processes connected to the Holocaust. Because I think at this point, especially with my generation, the Holocaust is getting into like a historic distance that uh, I had the honor to know my great grandfather who lived at the time of the Holocaust and, and he told me several stories, which were incredible, but I think well, we are slightly out of touch. And when you, um, you know, define the Holocaust memory as a discursive memory, I am like, wondering whether this, all these mem actual memories that we have from the survivals of the Holocaust, uh, how these memories are somehow for us getting out of touch and how it would be possible to somehow reconnect with the historic memory of the Holocaust and of this particular individual in uh, today's time, what you might have confronted with and, and what you saw in your uh, professional life. I think the reason for that is because in many of the political processes that are, we, are, you know, we are facing <laughs> these days, this, uh, this like, discourse of hate uh, is coming forth again and again. And if we could somehow reintroduce the memories of the survival, the surviving people and these stories into our everyday life, there that might be a very powerful tool to notice and fight against this developing political narratives that are uh, pointing towards um, uh, a certain kind of political and um, other cultural uh, exclusion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very important question. Um, you know, what you're describing is a generational transition that's taking place. Um, and generational transitions are inevitable. <laughs> this is part of the human life and more we are mortal and finite beings. And so there's, there's something, this is going to happen, right? And it's something that people who um, work in the field, if you could put it that way, or concerned about Holocaust memory have actually been thinking about for decades. It's, I'm fascinated by this actually. The discussions about this generational transition go back at least to 
around 1980, right? And so 40 years later, we're still, we're still thinking about this. And, but we're getting closer to that moment when there will not be eyewitnesses. The eyewitness generation will no longer be here. And just in the last couple of years, a couple of the witnesses uh, who have meant the most to me, not people I knew personally, but whose work meant the most to me have, have died. Ruth Kluger, on the one hand, whose memoir Weiterleben, published in Germany and German, and then uh, still alive, published in English, was uh, incredibly important for me, or the woman that I spoke of in the film Chronicle of a Summer, Marceline Loredan Evans, who I talk about both in multidirectional memory and in, um, in the implicated subject, uh, also passed away very recently. And so we're obviously, we're getting to a moment of, of transition. And within the field of memory studies, we call this the transition from communicative memory to cultural memory. In other words, memory that is passed down uh, intergenerationally across generations in mostly intimate small settings like the family, but not only the family. And we're coming to a moment when, you know, communicative memory is going to give way to, to cultural memory, which is memory that is necessarily has to be materialized in texts and monuments and films and all of this sort of stuff. You know, I think one thing we've realized, though, recently, and probably has to do with changes in lifespan, among other things, <laughs> among people, is that the phase of communicative memory is perhaps longer than we thought it was. And so when this the term communicative memory comes from the Jan and Alida Asman, and when they have talk about it, they usually talk about it as a span of 80 to 100 years. But my sense is that, and that it's three generations, right? But you already talked about your great uh, grand. Uh, father, I believe it was. So we're already talking about four generations. And, you know, I think ultimately, and you now have a kind of intimate familial connection to this history, which you will carry on, and you will transmit as well. And of course, it's not the same as someone who lived through it, but you still have that kind of, you know, touch in a certain sense, that intimacy uh, to, related to that language. And in some ways, that, that gives you certain responsibilities, perhaps also, but also opportunities maybe. Um, but I guess my point, part of my point here was that, yeah, in fact, I think this span of communicative memory goes further back than we think. I'm really struck by uh, this wonderful book by uh, Saidia Hartman about uh, the slave, transatlantic slave trade called Lose Your Mother, in which she recounts a story, uh, someone about my age, I think she is, Hartman, um, recounts a story of talking to her, in fact, I think great grandfather, who had himself, very vague, but still some memories of being told about slavery by his ancestors who themselves had been through it. So, and I, what I take from that is even, sla even right, slavery in the United States ended in 1865, officially at least, right? Some of those communicative memories are still fragilely, but somehow being passed. So it's, I mean, this is an interesting, important question to think about. Um, how you preserve those things, how you pass them on, despite the inevitability of generational change. I mean, that's a challenge that everybody is thinking about. I guess for my part, I don't know, this connects a little bit to my, to my interest in, my, in mem the memory of migrants, because it seems to me that migrants, like again, in my example, say Turkish German migrants uh, in Germany today, um, become a kind of model for the subject who does not have the direct familial intimate connection to the history, um, but yet needs to find ways to engage with it. So in our project on what we call mi migrant archives of Holocaust remembrance, we're interested in the ways that um, various people who do not have a family connection in particular, um, still can practice forms of Holocaust remembrance, right? And still find ways of engaging and negotiating with this history and with the memory culture that you find in Germany. And I'm thinking then, and, and this in some ways does go back to the question of eyewitnesses and survivors, but one of, for me, one of the inspiring examples of an unusual and unexpected collaboration is the group uh, Bejarano and Microphone Mafia, right? Which is a collaboration between a Holocaust survivor, Esther Bejarano, and a migrant hip hop group, Microphone Mafia, uh, right? Who tour Germany and uh, perform songs in multiple languages, including Yiddish. Um, but also German and Turkish and Italian and other languages, migrant languages in Germany. Um, and, um, 
you know, are finding and, and do it in the form of hip hop. And so we're trying to find new, new ways to carry and new vectors for memory um, that both look back to the history itself in its specificity, but also engage with the forms of the present and the social relations of the present and the technologies of the present, the genres of the present and try to make those connections. But it's still very much reliant, I think, on the figure of Esther Bejarano now, I think 96 years old and still performing when she can. Um, and she, that won't happen for many more years, I, I have to imagine, though we, we can hope that it will. Um, so we need to be creative, I guess. I think we need to be creative. And we have an incredible archive. I mean, certainly when we're talking about the Holocaust, we have an incredible archive of testimonies, both written and video now that we can draw on. Um, but I think the question is how you connect those to the present. And to me, again, that's where multidirectionality is a kind of, um, can represent an opportunity to allow people to see how these histories resonate with their own, you know, not to relativize them, not to equate them, not to minimize them, hopefully, though it can happen, right? We can't prevent that, but to try to find links and connections, affective links. It has to be, it has to somehow be affectively, emotionally charged if we want to transmit the memory. And so, yeah, I think that's the challenge. Anyway, I appreciate your question. I think it's a, it's a really important one. There's no easy answer, I guess is my answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Florian Becker also had a question. You raised your hand and lowered it again, so I'm not really sure if you, the question still stands, but... You could... Sure, it's just that, you know, Miksha anticipated some of it, but, but let me just uh, try to entice uh, Michael to maybe talk a little bit of his reading of this uh, strange situation of the reception of the book here in Germany and take or leave what you want. Um, I had a question originally also about uh, the generational question mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. transition between history and Zeitgeschichte and you know the fact that the grassroots stuff started and in, in, in memory and memory activism started in the 70s and 80s having to do of course with what's at stake in this nation personally and intrafamilially in terms of responsibility and in terms also of uh, questions more broadly speaking now of continuing injustice of uh, restitution, reparation, continuing material advantage and so on, which seems to play some sort of role in the current German situation also. I don't quite know what that role is, but it does seem to have to do with some effect, to some extent with the, 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 the fact that, um, you know, the, many migrant groups and many, um, sort of uh, racially identified groups are uh, more visible and more numerous than um, German Jews, including the, the, the more recently immigrated Jews. And in some ways, it's more convenient and easier to have the, the, the sort of, you know, memorialized memory uh, that you have, of course, sort of embodied in the Holocaust Memorial, as you as you mentioned, than it is to, 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 to engage with questions even of colonial uh, inheritance where you'd think this should be easy because it doesn't concern anyone living, right? Mm -hmm. But then because of various identifications and figures of solidarity, it seems to be in some ways hitting closer to home and hitting closer to more tangible uh, interests and, and sensitivities. It's a. It's not really a question, but more of an yeah. invitation. To yeah, me. and I and I don't entirely know what to say except that I do feel like I mean I felt this or I feel this in the French context, which I actually don't know as well at this point as the German context. In some of these discussions about Islamo gauchism and uh, again identity and postcolonial studies that that we're all you're also having in Germany. I really do have a strong sense that part of what's happening a part of the response to my book and part of the response to a lot of these questions is a kind of reaction against the transformation of European societies and the becoming more multicultural, for lack of a better word, of German societies and uh, a struggle over authority and who gets to speak and whose experience counts. 
and things like that. I don't know if that's the kind of thing that you were getting at, but that is part of what I, you know, part, part of what I think is going on, or it seems to me, it's a, it's in a, it's a struggle over interpretive authority. And there's an attempt um, by a certain demographic to hold on to interpretive authority and um, to not cede it to, uh, you know, some of the groups that you mentioned, uh, migrant groups, minority, racialized minority groups, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is a kind of struggle going on there of who gets to define what. Um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of Jews in Germany, and again, not, I, I no claim to be an expert, but I'm in touch with a lot of people. There are a lot of very active and interesting Jews in Germany right now working in the cultural realm, especially, and they're, and they're not necessarily German Jews, so some of them are, um, but they're Israeli Jews and American Jews, and um, interestingly, they are often the target of the same kinds of responses that I'm getting with my book, right? And so there have been some very infamous examples in the last year the famous unlearning Zionism project, art project, right, uh, which caused such a stir. Um, and so you get Israeli Jews being labeled as anti-Semitic and you get American Jews being labeled as Holocaust relativizers, which I have to admit is I find personally, but also for others, incredibly disturbing. Um, and um, so there's a lot, you know, there's a lot going on, I suppose, right now, and I don't claim to understand it all. Um, but I'm kind of, but I also note that I think within, within more mainstream currents of German, or let's say more empowered currents of German society, there's also a great interest in new approaches and new ways of thinking about memory and identity and anti-Semitism. And so I really welcomed the initiative, the Weltoffenheit initiative last year and, and support it and su supported it at the time and continue to support it and take great comfort from the fact that I am also in dialogue with people like those who are present here today who are interested in having maybe more complicated discussions about some of these questions that break with some of the rigidity of um, the dominant discourse. I guess, so So let me put it in terms I've, I've been using also recently. I think the culture of Holocaust memory in Germany which was once this incredible active grassroots culture has become dogmatic. It's become, it's become rigid and dogmatic. And, um, and I think that's what a lot of us are pushing against and are interested in opening up to give it back some of the vitality that it had in the eighties say, and that it still has in certain quarters. Um, but it's a bit of a, but it's a bit of a struggle because there's a kind of orthodoxy, it seems to me. Um, which is trying to hold on to the narrative and try to hold on to its position of interpretive authority. I'll stop there <laughs> before I get into more trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Um, f do, do you still have the, the stamina for last? Maybe, uh, maybe one more? Maybe one, one more, more from, yeah. from Facebook. And okay, wonderful. Or there's someone who has their hand up here, I see. But whatever you, you, whatever you guys want. Yeah, there are two, really, two if you want, two if you want. A lot, a lot of very interesting comments on um, on Facebook. So if you have the time to read it, eventually it's. I'll look for sure. Very yeah. interesting, um, but I I would give Christine priority now to ask a question. Hi, uh, thank you so much for speaking. Uh, this is very exciting and also um, exciting because I uh, refer to you in my thesis that oh. I'm working on. Um, so I have a question to you. Like I talk a little bit about how uh, Germany remembers um, the Wiedervereinigung, the fall of the Berlin Wall in which mm -hmm. perspectives are kind of wiped out of this uh, tradition of remembering, which is a lot of there's perspectives of um, so-called guest workers. Yeah. Um, and how, and also talking about how the Jewish people are, there's this one author who talks about the performance of um, Jewish people in, um, in German remembrance of the Holocaust and how a lot of younger Jewish um, individuals would like to disidentify from this very static 
notion or place in, in German remembrance culture. Mm -hmm. And I think my question would be if you think that the approach of multidirectional um, memory, maybe of among, um, maybe it does um, create alliances uh, among historically marginalized groups and how that is, that is also a perspective for the future to, um, if people, if individuals kind of, um, if they have the room to um, renegotiate their own roles in, in remembrance. Yeah. Maybe, I, like I was thinking of maybe that approach is a, is a way to um, to empower sort of the marginalized peoples and create uh, alliances. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's entirely in the spirit of what I see myself as doing or trying to do. So, you know, as, well, as, as we were discussing earlier in response to uh, Frank's question, I'm certainly not claiming that all forms of multi-directional memory are good or ethical or ones that we want to support. But I do feel like, and this is what I say in the book, and I still believe it, that it represents a potential for, for, for new forms of solidarity. And that's what really interests me. And in, um, in that essay that I referred to earlier called From Gaza to Warsaw, and then in my new book, uh, newer book, Implicated Subject, I develop what I call differentiated solidarity. And that's the notion that we can uh, link, you know, thinking of my quadrant that I explained earlier, the, the, the notion that we can bring together different histories without subsuming them into the same. We can hold them in their differences and that we can hold them in their differences in order to construct forms of solidarity across groups, right? So this is what really interests me is precisely that kind of um, cross identity forms of solidarity. And, and, and I would say both, among differently minoritized and marginalized and racialized groups, but also, and I think this is important, it's important for me as a white person in the United States, also from positions of dominance in alliance with marginalized groups, right? So, you know, thinking, of course, like everybody else in the world, basically in the last year about Black Lives Matter and what it means to be in solidarity with and in alliance with movements like that, for me, it has to come from a position of differentiated solidarity, right? Even if as a Jew, there's a history of suffering, you know, that I in some ways inherit, it's not the same, and it's certainly not the same in the present. So if I want to be in an alliance and solidarity with people who are suffering today from racial racism, structural and otherwise, it has to be a kind of differentiated solidarity. And I guess I do see that in Germany as well. And again, you know, I've, it's been a few years since I've been there. I've spent a fair amount of time in the last 20 years in Germany. And for me, the, I've, I mentioned this already, but this is maybe the limits of, of what, what I can say at the moment. It was really, especially um, back in like 2008, 2009, 2011, 2012, spending a lot of time at the Ballhaus Nauninstrasse when Shermin Langhoff was running it before she moved to the Gorky and seeing that incredible, um, very heterogeneous, very creative mix of young people, writers and actors and musicians doing amazing things, um, the center of which is certainly not Holocaust memory, but where you actually find some really interesting articulations of Holocaust memory, along with memories relating to migration and unification, uh, the experience of racism in the present, all, all sorts of things. And it's a group that is, Jewish and non-Jewish, migrant and German, um, you know, queer, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is, to me, this is uh, incredibly, ins remains incredibly inspiring, the work of these kinds of, uh, these kinds of creative people. And I do think, again, to go back to some of the um, Jews that I'm in touch with in, in Germany today, I can say are like directly inspired by notions of multidirectionality and are doing work so for example, I've been in touch with an Israeli filmmaker who lives in Berlin, Dani Gal, right? Who, who draws on, on my work and, and, and other, others as well. So I think, yeah, I think it's there. I certainly don't claim to have all the answers, but I'm really interested in the way that artists are developing these kinds of models, sometimes with reference to my work, but of course, mostly not with reference to my work. And, and, that's, and that's great. And so, yeah, I think your intuitions are are correct, and I look forward to seeing what you produce. I'd love to see to hear more about it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've spent all, almost two hours, and um, they've 
flew oh, mm. like I didn't even notice that uh, <laughs> discussing already two hours. Um, it's been super, super interesting. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. And also, uh, thank you, Frank, um, yeah. for sharing all these materials and thoughts. Um, I hope we can continue this, also uh, continue historicizing directional memory. I have a lot of question about the history mm. um, and the emergence of, um, of these structures. Mm. And um, thanks again, and um, thank you for, the, um, uh, for your contributions in the audience and on Facebook, and um, see you again soon, hopefully. Yep. It's been great. I really appreciate the chance to talk with you all. <laughs>